Marion Barghouti, thanks so much for joining us on Upfront. Thank you for having me. Marion, right now, more than 31,000 people have been killed so far in Israel's siege on Gaza. Uh, the humanitarian situation on the ground is becoming even more dire. I mean, Gazans are struggling for survival. A quarter of the population is facing starvation. Uh, I know you have friends, family uh, in Gaza. What's the situation like? What are you hearing on the ground? It's, it's such an important question to ask, and yet one of the most difficult ones to capture, because no words and no videos can really showcase the struggle of just being alive, of just having another breath hour by hour. That is 31,000 killed by direct airstrike. We still don't know the actual numbers, and in including those that were denied medical care, um, and in including those that are, are dying from lack of medicines and access to medical care, those that are injured and succumbing to wounds, the, the numbers really don't show you the reality of every single day, people having to go and scout and scavenger for whatever food that they can find. And this is a man-made problem. This is, this is a condition that is created and enforced tactically and strategically by Israel to not just kill through airstrikes, that is for the destruction of any infrastructure left in Gaza, but it is to decapacitate the Palestinian population there. And it is to quite literally kill them um, in order to pave the way for building new Israeli settlements, which as we have seen already, Israeli politicians and representatives are pushing forward the building of new settlements in Gaza. While the international focus, of course, has been on Gaza, uh, there's an important attention that needs to be paid as well to the West Bank. Um, I see protests, I see rallies of support uh, going on there, but I also see an increase in raids, arrests, killings, et cetera. Uh, what's been your experience since October 7th uh, with how the conditions are in the West Bank? The conditions in the West Bank are dire. And, and of course, for Palestinians in the West Bank, there is that recognition and expectation that as soon as Israel finishes with Gaza, it's going to begin um, intensifying attacks in the West Bank. And settler attacks against Palestinians are increasing, and Israeli ministers are arming Israeli settlers who are illegal in the West Bank with new assault wife, uh, rifles, as they have been since October 7th. And then adding to that, I think in light of the travesty and how profoundly violent the 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 attack of Israel on Gaza is that we're not able to fully process and understand the level and extent of attack that is happening in the West Bank. Israel is using aerial bombing through drones on Palestinian civilian homes. It is locking up refugees in their own refugee camps, including elderly and children, for days at a time. Now, imagine being locked in your kitchen for three days. You're 80. You have zero access to your meds. You have zero access to a phone. And that's become the norm here. You, you talk about the increase in settler attacks. Um, there was a response to that. President Biden decided, after the United Nations documented more than 570 attacks by settlers since the October 7 uh, war began. Uh, and he has said he would impose financial sanctions and travel bans on individuals guilty of attacking Palestinians and, quote, undermining peace security and stability in the West Bank. Of course, there's a lot of debate about the effectiveness of these sanctions, or even if they're being enforced. Um, what do you make of uh, President Biden's choice to do that? I think President Biden is very much on brand in terms of American administrations and their foreign policy. The President Biden allowed and sponsored and funded Israel during this ongoing ethnic cleansing and genocidal practices being committed in Gaza. So to say that, hey, we're going to hold few individuals accountable, but we're going to actually keep empowering the regime is merely a symbolic gesture um, for history books that really conflate what happened in reality and what was said in, in public meetings and press conferences. I think President Biden's trying to save face, but even in that move, there was no recognition of Israel as an apartheid regime. There was no recognition for Palestinian right um, on this land to live freely and with dignity. It was more of, let's try to curb settler attacks a little bit because it's kind of getting noisy. You talk about this relationship between the U.S. and, and Israel and, of course, what's happening in, in, in Gaza and the West Bank. 
Uh, it made me think of something that happened last Sunday. A, a real estate show was held at a synagogue in Teaneck, New Jersey, where a number of companies were pitching uh, land and properties in Israel and the West Bank uh, to potential American buyers. Now, while illegal encroachment on the West Bank certainly isn't new, uh, events like these seem to be coming more and more to the fore in the U.S., Canada, etc. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, why do you think it's happening now? So the, the Israeli practices of continuing um, the encroachment on Palestinian lands, of course, hasn't stopped. Even during this ongoing aggression after October 7th, we've seen Israel continue building the apartheid wall in areas such as Jenin, north of the West Bank, um, and other areas as well. And in terms of the United States and Canada and selling areas of land here or marketing lands here to buyers and abroad and allowing that to continue, especially during a genocide, is very telling of how Israel is a colonial state, that this is how it began, by trying to sell Palestinian lands um, to others and inviting them to come here. But you need, there's also another layer to what is happening um, in that regards. The United States and Canada have actually been pushing for Palestinians to apply for visas and asylum in the United States and Canada, especially Canada has really been promoting Palestinian um, departure from here and trying to build new lives there. And it shows you how the form of depopulation, ethnic cleansing has a bureaucratic layer. And, th and that's where foreign policy also allows um, for the facilitation of our depopulation as well. Do, do you have any fear about that as a kind of big picture in game? I mean, I'm thinking about uh, a few days ago, I spoke to a doctor at El Shifa Hospital, and uh, 31 of his uh, family members had been killed. He's staying to conduct surgeries in the hospital, but he's actively taking his family to Egypt. And I said to him, hey, like, are you not worried that you're not going to be allowed back in, just like in 1948? He said, I can't worry about that right now. People are dying. So between the pressures of being pushed out from, from the threat of the bombings to the kind of diplomatic, political, and economic incentives to go around the, around the world, are you worried that this project of, quote-unquote, self-deportation uh, is going to be effective? I think we're only flesh and bone. And I think as Palestinians, you have, you know, your family that you love and your friends. And how can you ask anyone to just keep taking it? Just keep living the bombs. Just keep feeling your body eat itself um, and trying to push yourself a little further to go get some water. So it's understandable because I myself, I'm, I'm having to witness people I love um, and colleagues as well and help facilitate their evacuation from Gaza to Egypt. And that, that's, these are like impossible missions to an extent. You have to pay almost $5,000 to $7,000 per an adult and $2,500 for a child. It's a form of extortion in order to be able to leave a place that is being slaughtered, that is a slaughterhouse. I do think that the, the end goal is to, yes, evacuate Palestinians and depopulate them. This is part of the strategy, force them to flee. The creation of a humanitarian crisis is a tactic. The, the denial of water entry is a tactic. The forcing global powers to feel like they can't do anything, except now we're seeing the dropping of humanitarian aid, which is actually resulting in the killing of Palestinians and in the destruction of hospital infrastructure rather than actually feed a starving population. Yeah, I see us being depopulated, but at the same time, again, we're only flesh and bone, which is why we appeal to the international community, which is why we ask for and demand for the opening of Rafah both ways, not one way. Uh, because, yeah, we do see these tactics and we've seen what they've done before. But what's different now is the recognition of what happened in 1948 and the demands of what's to come now, that Gaza is Palestinian and it needs to be seen as Palestinian. The West Bank is Palestinian. Jerusalem is Palestinian. Yaffa, Safad, Palestinian. These were taken in 1948. Jerusalem, 1967, Israel's trying to take what remains in 2024. But if we bring back that knowledge, then these tactics would just fail. It's, it's, it's on us to decide whether these tactics fail or not, rather than to place someone that is being starved and try to, to demand of them to endure this monstrosity. What role does leadership play in that? One of the things that comes out of Palestinian civil society, one of the things we've seen emerging is a kind of sense of 
uh, distrust and disillusionment uh, with a lot of the leadership, including the Palestinian Authority, uh, which is the governing, of course, body which administers parts of the West Bank. Uh, do you see the PA playing a role in the future either of the West Bank or Gaza? And, and, and if so, is that a good thing? You know, I constantly find myself stuck between laughter and tears when it comes to that, because the Palestinian Authority has aided and abetted Israel in this genocide. And any talk about a future role how? for how? the PA... Can, can you say a little bit about how? Uh, because a lot of people that have seemed counterintuitive. Right. So the Palestinian Authority basically came into power in 1994, 95, was supposed to be an interim government, but instead began receiving funding um, by the United States and Germany to uh, create a police force, essentially, that is trained in riot control rather than defense, because the West Bank was demilitarized under the Oslo agreements. And the Palestinian Authority took on a role as a proxy army for Israel in the West Bank. As you see, Israel's always saying, why don't you ensure our security? So the Palestinian Authority arrests Palestinians on behalf of Israel. It has supported Israel um, and this is why no one really sees any hope in them. But it is disheartening that, for example, a lot of the questions throughout, just even before this war was, well, do you condemn Hamas? Instead of really trying to delve into what Hamas is, um, it is a political party that has grown in contra to Fatah. And then you have the Qassam Brigade, which is the armed wing um, for Hamas currently fighting on the ground. Um, rather than asking Palestinians, well, what is your imagination of a political party? And that's where this becomes difficult, because we've been focused so much on trying to answer the very much irrelevant questions. Little room was left for Palestinians to have radical imagination in mm. terms of designing and imagining a new future for them. The, uh, who said the leadership choices is reduced to these two? That's the American system. For us, it's very different. Um, and we've seen leaders come out in times of need. When Palestinians went in uprising in the streets and they found no one, they found each other and they created leadership from the ground. So the ground births leadership. And I think everyone's concern about Palestinians and the, the lack, I guess, of leadership is because they don't know who to speak with. But for Palestinians, we are you know, very much creating in community. And if it's not... It, the, this whole who is the Palestinian leader, why, to negotiate how much more of our lives can be taken or our resources taken, rather than asking, well, okay, the Israeli leadership is corrupt, being led by a prime minister that is corrupt, uh, whose leaders have a history of committing crimes against humanity and enforcing apartheid. I don't understand why we don't focus on, for example, how we can dismantle that leadership in order to empower and, and help Palestinians build their representatives freely, not with a chokehold on them. Maryam Barghouti, thank you so much for joining us today on Upfront. Thank you so much for having me, Mark.